welcome to Etz Chaim, which means the Tree of Life. We're a messianic congregation that understands that Jesus is Yeshua, our Messiah, and He wants us to follow the Torah just as He did. Come check us out. You're invited to join us for our Saturday service at 1 p.m. You can also gain valuable insights at our 4 p.m. Bible study. Your questions are welcome. And now, with a weekly Torah reading, Rabbi Mordecai Silver. This week's message in the portion is Kitavo. It means when you enter in. It's Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 29, 8. The Haftorah portion is Isaiah 60, 1 through 22. And the Apostolic Scripture or New Testament portion is 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 2. The introduction, this week's Padasha or portion, Kitavo derives its name from Kitavo El Haaretz, when you come into the land, a joyous declaration, and it was the announcement that their journey was coming to an end. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 2. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You'll notice that in the book of Deuteronomy, what you're seeing over and over and over again is not just Moses reiterating the commandments that God had given to Moses to give to the children of Israel, but over and over and over again, Moses is emphasizing to the children of Israel that they need to obey the Lord their God. If they want to see his blessings when they enter into the land, they need to follow his commandments. And we know that they did that for a short time after they went into the land, but we know they also fell away. And it's the same thing throughout the history of, of Israel and throughout the history of mankind, that we don't always obey the voice of the Lord. And the thing about it all is, and the reason that we tie it is because God says to us, all you have to do is obey me. And if you do that, and it's your choice whether you do or not, I'll bless you. And he tells the children of Israel, here you are. You are on the threshold of entering into that promise that I gave to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And now you will go in and you will possess that promise. And if you obey me, I will bless you. All you have to do is obey my voice. And what is his voice? What did he tell us? His voice is the Torah. His voice is his son. And it just is amazing that all you have to do is do what Yeshua taught us to do. And what did Yeshua teach us to do? Follow the Torah. That's all he asked us to do. And that's why I love the Torah so much. And it's not about being saved by the keeping of the Torah, but pleasing God. That's what it's all about. That is our responsibility as believers in Messiah. Our responsibility is to please God. And we do that because we love him. And if you don't love him, don't bother trying. Because you're trying to do that then through your own power and not through the power that God gives you. And what's the power that God gives you? God gives you at the point of salvation. He fills you with the Ruach HaKodesh of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowers you to live out the life that God desires for you if you're willing to do that. And he doesn't promise or tell you that it's all going to be smooth sailing. He says that he will bless you, that he will provide for you, that he will take care of you. And he will be there to see you through the hard times. In Revelation 13, 8, and I shared this before, and it says, all the inhabitants of the earth will worship him. Those who are not written in the book of life of the slain lamb before the foundations of the world. Everyone who is living during that period of time, during the Messianic age, will worship him. And even if they are unbelievers, they have to worship him. But you know, even before that point, even before we get to that point in Revelation, we have to realize that ever since Yeshua came, 
and he died. And then he was resurrected and he ascended to his father where he is now waiting for that day when he returns. There have always been false prophets and false teachers. They've been there since the beginning. They are here now. They have always been. And it's up to each and every one of us to learn how to discern the teachings that we are receiving. And in 2 Peter 2, 1, and I've shared this scripture with you too. But there were also false prophets among the people, as also false prophets will be among you, who did, who will in, introduce heresies of destruction and deny the Lord who bought them, bringing on themselves swift destruction. If you ever sit at the foot of any teacher who denies Yeshua, you better get up and run in the other direction as fast as you can, because that is a heresy. To deny him is a heresy, because we are bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb. It's the only thing that takes away the sin of the world, people. Nothing else can do that. Belief in him is the only way to be reconciled to the Father. And it's the only way to have the power that God wants to give to you. And I mean that power is to live according to the Torah that God gives to us. The Torah, it doesn't give life in its own. Yeshua gives life. Yeshua is the bread of life and he's the living water. Whenever you see these references in scripture, it's not really very difficult to understand what the Lord is trying to do. He's using things that are common every single day and he's bringing new insight into that so he can ram home what he expects from us. He's the living water. He's the bread of life. There's the juice, the fruit of the vine, and there's the bread that's over there, the representative of the covenant that Messiah made with us. They don't take the place of the covenant. What he did was he was telling them that every time you did this, that you partook of, you said the blessing over the bread and you said the blessing over the fruit of the vine, that you would remember him. Remembering that in Judaism, they said the blessing over the bread and the blessing over the fruit of the vine every time they sat down and broke bread together. So they did this every single day. And every time they did it, they would remember Yeshua. And then when they broke bread together, they would talk about what Yeshua taught them and what they did. And then they would pass it on one to the other to the other. It was the oral teachings that were passed on down as they had been from one generation to the next. A lot of people don't understand the fact that the way that they're taught back then and there, it's oral. They didn't all have access to being able to write and all of these different things. So it was passed down from one generation to the next by orally transmitting the traditions, the customs, and the Torah was all kept up here. That's how you could see how the apostles and all the other disciples could go out and they could draw on what they knew because of what they had been taught and they could defend themselves in their faith. It's the same thing for us. What do you do if you're out and somebody starts discussing with you about Scripture, but you don't have a Bible on hand or you don't really know where to look in the Bible when you have it? Don't you think you should be stuffing your head with some Scriptures and some different things in there? So just remembering that you might not remember every single thing that's there, but maybe enough will stick that you might even be a little bit dangerous when you share Dangerous meant in a good way. I just believe that the Lord will open a door when it's there, and you never know that what you, a seed that you might plant in somebody else, you don't know what's going to happen. But you know the Lord will take care of it. And then people, they like to talk about, some people say, well, we don't really have free will. Because what about predestination? Okay, there's some scriptures that talk about that. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In Romans 8, 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. 
Ephesians 1, 5, he predestined us all for adoption as sons through Yeshua the Messiah, according to the purpose of his will. Ephesians 1, 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. At first glance, when you read these things, you know, you hear about predestined. He, he predestined, he predestined. He predestined. He predestined. So it means, well, where does free will enter into this? How about the concept of he predestined everyone to be saved? But only those who answer the call are the ones who will receive it. He calls all of us. He extends that gift to all of us. But he knows that not everyone is going to reach out and grab hold of it and take it and draw it near and make it part of themselves. He knows that there will be those who will reject it. He knows that there will be those who will harden their hearts against it. He knows there will be those who will not believe in Yeshua. And there's different reasons why they do that. Some people are blinded to the truth. If they're blinded to the truth, then the prayer has to be that the Lord will give them an opportunity. But what about those who know the truth and reject it? It's different. It's a different situation. It's a different circumstance. He predestined us for adoptions as son through Yeshua the Messiah. According to the purpose of his will, we are all predestined for adoptions as sons through Messiah. It's not how you were born or where you were born. Okay? It's who you are through your faith in Messiah. That brings you in as sons and daughters of God. That brings you in to Israel. That makes you part of God's people. And God's people are Israel. It's not just about the Jewish people. It's about everyone who accepts Yeshua and follows his teachings. In Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Arise, shine, for your light has come. We need to learn to hear his voice because Yeshua is the light in the darkness. I don't care if you go outside and the sun is shining fully bright and you're out there on a sunny day, we are still in darkness. And the darkness is coming and getting heavier and heavier each and every day. Because more and more of the world is rejecting Messiah and turning away from God. But God said that that would happen. And it's not that God is prophesying, it's the truth because God has already seen it take place. So right now we are living it out because that's the way it's been planned. In Numbers 22, 23 to 26, And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. And the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. Everybody knows the story about Balaam and his donkey and the angel of the Lord. You know, it's kind of funny because the only one that could see the angel of the Lord was the donkey. We call them jackasses. But who was the donkey? Balaam, I believe. Because the donkey could see the reality why Balaam couldn't. And yet he was used by God at times in order to bring a word from the Lord. And he was a pagan. 
I mean, pagan kings came to him and they wanted him to curse Israel. And the Lord came and spoke to him and says, don't curse Israel. And the Lord told them initially, he says, don't even go. Don't listen to Balak. Don't go and listen to what he's telling you. But ultimately, Balaam did it. And he went and he did it. And he rode on his donkey and he came to that place there where the donkey saw the angel of the Lord with a fiery sword and the donkey stopped. And Balaam beat on that donkey and that donkey would not move. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, the donkey speaks to him. Why are you hitting me? You know, it's almost like, you know, and Balaam is there talking to the donkey. It's almost like, well, what's wrong with this picture? Kind of, you know, but the donkey knew the voice of the Lord. The donkey could see what was ahead of him. Balaam couldn't because he was blinded to the truth. He did not see him until the Lord allowed him to see what was ahead of him. Isn't that the same thing that happens to us at times? Are we not blinded to the truth of the Lord and we can't see him? Think about it. In Revelation 19.7, it says, We are glad and rejoice. We will give him praise because the marriage feast of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Who is the bride? We are supposed to be part of the bride. If we heed the voice of the Lord and we believe in Yeshua and we're doing what Yeshua has taught us to do. And what did Yeshua teach us how to do? He taught us Torah. He taught us the Torah, people. The Torah is the blueprint of God's plan. The Torah is the book of God's instructions and God's teachings to mankind. It's what he gave us in order to order our lives. Interesting enough, and I've shared this before, it always seems like the Torah has always been accepted as being scripture. It's always been accepted as being from God. Nobody's ever questioned it. The only thing they do question is discussion about the who wrote the Torah. They go, Moses couldn't have written the Torah. There's no way he could have written it. Personally, I believe what the Bible has to say and that Moses was the author of the Torah. The Bible is truth. The Bible is the most popular book that has ever been written. And people still buy it to this day. And there's a multitude of Bibles. That, and everybody that translates a Bible has a different perspective on how it's to be translated. All you have to do is go get the Christian book distributor's catalog and look under Bibles. It goes on for pages and pages. They have a Bible for this, a Bible for that, a Bible this way and a Bible that way and all of that. You know, whatever Bible works for you, go with it. As long as your nose is in the truth of God, that's what counts. But if it turns you away from God, then you need to think about it. In Matthew 22, 9, it says, Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. We've all been extended an invitation to come to the wedding. But now this is where it changes. And there are scriptures in here, and Yeshua prominently talks about it in a couple of places when he talks about the wedding of the Lamb. And he talks about the wedding feast. That there's the bride, and there are the guests, and there are the servants. They are all in the kingdom. But each one has a different place in the kingdom. Not everyone is part of the bride. Not everyone will be a guest. And there will be those that will be servants. That's what it says in scripture. That's what the Lord has told us. And that's the reality that we need to accept and learn about that. Who's going to be the bride? I don't know. You know, we, we've got different pictures in Scripture about, you know, who might be the bride, who might not be, but don't get so caught up in yourself that you become arrogant at a point where you're sitting there and you, 
or standing there and you puff your chest out and all that kind of things and you go, I'm going to be the part of the bride. I'm going to be in the bride. I'm going to be this and all of that. You are whatever God wants you to be. Okay? And as long as you are in the kingdom, what difference does it make? I always said I'd rather be a janitor in the kingdom of God to be a king in the kingdom of hell. You know, one place is really too hot. And the other place, I think the weather's just real nice like in Hawaii year-round. The same. Except you won't be living near any volcanoes or anything like that. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 12. And surely it is upright before God that he should repay oppression to your oppressors. And you who are oppressed, he will make alive with us at the appearance of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who will appear from heaven with the power of his messengers, when he will execute vengeance with the burning of fire on those who do not know God and on those who do not acknowledge the gospel of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. For in the judgment they will be repaid with eternal destruction from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his power. After he comes to be glorified with his holy ones and shows his wonders in his faithful ones, because our testimony about you will be believed in that day. Because of this, we pray always for you that God will count you worthy of your calling and will fill you with all desire for good things and for the works of faith by power that in you the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah will be glorified and that you also will be glorified in him according to the grace of our God and our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. This is in the day of judgment when Yeshua returns and the white throne judgment and the Lord will judge all of mankind. It says he will have vengeance with burning fire. And it talks about, in that day, it talks about the lake of fire. And I believe, according to Scripture, that it, it, it might be a literal lake of fire because it says that that's where the beast, and that's where the false prophet, and that's where Satan will be for all eternity being tormented every single day that they exist for what they've done. The Torah is God's living word. And it's what he uses to hold us accountable. For in the judgment they will be repaid with eternal destruction from the presence of our Lord and from the glory of his power. Eternal destruction, what does that mean? Does it mean that they are judged and then they are destroyed forever? Or is eternal destruction mean eternal separation from God and then to see from a point that they will be separated, but yet a divide that they can look over and they can see the blessings that God is pouring out on those that are his own. I don't know. I can't tell you that completely clearly because Scripture's not totally clear in those areas about these things, but it makes you think. It should make you want to pause and consider Why would you reject and turn away from God? Why would you reject and turn away from Yeshua? Why would you reject and turn away from his teachings in the Torah? Because God loves us so much that he did not only send Yeshua to bring us eternal life, but he gave us the Torah to know what he considers to be right and wrong. And Isaiah 42, 5 says, Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. He created everything that is. In Isaiah 45, 18, for thus says the Lord who creates the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. If God says he is God and there is no other, wouldn't that be the gospel truth? 
I'm not going to argue with him about it. But yet some people would. God doesn't mind if you question him. Because God will teach with you. I mean, doesn't he say in Isaiah, come now and re- you know, we'll reason with one another. The thing is, is that do you really think you're changing God's mind or is God working it so that you will come and see the reality of what the truth is and you change your mind? Malachi 2.10 Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Do you believe in his covenant? His covenant's been from the beginning. He established his covenant from the beginning. And then he has amended his covenant. He has not created new covenants. He has amended the covenant that he started with in the beginning. Why did he amend it? He amended it because man changed, not God. And he amended it so he could conclude all those different times that mankind needed to be part of that. He didn't throw out one covenant and then replace it with another because that would mean that God changes his mind. If God changes his mind, how can you trust God? So God cannot change his mind. We change. Because that's the way we were created. Until the time comes when we can't change any longer. to our television audience come and enjoy yourself through our website you can find all kinds of materials all kinds of videos all kinds of audio teachings all kinds of written teachings then join us on our discussion site our forum Torah Talk Shalom everyone Shalom everyone